first decided that I wanted to be a lawyer, I didn't know any lawyers personally. Nobody in my family had ever been to uh, university. We'd certainly never come across um, lawyers in our ordinary everyday life. But I come from Liverpool. And my grandmother was a great fan of Rose Howbron QC. And of course, Rose Howbron QC was the first ever woman QC. She was also the first woman to defend someone on a murder charge when there was still the death penalty and first woman to plead at the Old Bailey. She did so many firsts. And Rose was a girl from Liverpool. And Liverpool were tremendously proud of, of Rose Halbron. And my grandmother used to go and watch her when she was in the Liverpool Assizes and used to come back and talk about her. And I thought, well, if one girl from Liverpool can make it as a lawyer, why shouldn't this girl from Liverpool make it as a lawyer? I didn't know that I was going to love the law so much when I went into it, but I do love the law and I think it's an amazing way uh, to uh, be able to influence social change, to use the law to, to right wrongs, to, to, to fight injustices. I still believe in that. This is my certificate of standing as a barrister called to the bar at Lincoln's Inn. The reason I like that is because when it came to do this certificate, they said father's name and occupation. And I said, I don't want to put my father's name and occupation on this certificate because he had left my mother when I was eight and has not been involved in my upbringing. It's my mother's. This is my mother's achievement. And they said, oh, well, no one's ever put, wanted to put their mother's name on before. And I said, but I, re I really insist I want my mother's name on this certificate. And indeed, they put it on. And um, so that was my, my, my first little act of, of rebellion and, and striking out for, 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 for women's rights because I wanted my mother to be acknowledged. I can remember at the call because I was a top student, I was, a, I was invited to make the speech and sit with the benches and Lord Denning being there saying to me, oh, well, you know, really, you know, the bar isn't really the place for, uh, for women, so it's not exactly the most encouraging way to start. Um, I don't know, somehow or other, I felt that, that I, was, I was going to be different. But, you know, I went on to do my pupillage and I can remember... Looking back, <clears throat> that whole first year, though there were women in chambers, there were two other women in chambers who were tenants at that time, I never ever saw a woman barrister appear in court that whole time I did my pupillage. All the people I saw standing up and advocate, advocating were all men. And for, for a woman, you know, you've got to find, as an advocate, you have to find your voice. And so, you know, it's quite a challenge when you didn't see many women advocates to know what a woman advocate's voice should sound like. But that didn't mean that the, the, there weren't uh, other role models. So I always remember as a pupil, we did a case and Derry Irvin was our pupil master and he did a case against Tom Bingham. Um, and the two of them you know, locked horns over that. Now Derry, you know, a big man, big presence. And I would always say that his cross-examination technique was a bit like a rhinoceros. You know, he was out there. And then I watched Tom Bingham cross-examine the same witnesses. He was like a snake, much more subtle, uh, sinuous. And I thought, actually, I'm probably better trying to be a snake rather than a rhinoceros. This, of course, is the, the usual Queen's Council's uh, certificate, which uh, obviously is a, a treasured possession. And I do have a story about this as well, because of, obviously, you see, we are one of Her Majesty's Council learned in the law. Now, by the time in 1995 that I was made, so my husband, of course, had become the leader of the opposition. And as you know, in those days, the... Uh, announcement of Queen's Council always came out on Maundy Thursday and as it happened the night before that <coughs> my husband was invited as leader of the opposition with 
me to stay to the Queen, by the Queen to Windsor Castle, to say there's a, there's a tradition, you go and you stay at Windsor Castle. And so I like to think that I'm probably one of the few Queen's Council who actually was able to thank Her Majesty personally for appointing me one of her council, learned in the law. That's me with my dad and my mother. When I became Queen's Council, Rose Halber on my role model was number one. I was still number 76. So from 1949 to 1995, that's quite a long time to have had only 75 more women QCs. So, um, you know, we still have a way to go and it's partly a question, of course, about the whole issue about work-life balance, what you do when children come along. When, when I started uh, in 1980s, when, when my first son was born in 1984, I was so determined to prove to those men in chambers, because I was the only woman in chambers, and the only previous time they'd had a woman in chambers, as soon as she had babies, she left, so determined to show that I was going to come back, you know, that I came back very quickly. I, I had no maternity, you know, we, we, I didn't have any waivers of fees. There was, I still was paying all my outgoings on chambers. Uh, completely different today, of course, when there's, there's provisions for maternity leave, indeed for paternity leave as well. So that at least helps women. But it's still difficult as a self-employed barrister to manage family life and, and a practice. Well, when we came to set up Matrix, we had, we had a number of, of, of aims. I mean, the bar has always been a traditional profession. And, um, you know, when you first, when I first went into the bar, you know, everybody called me Miss, and the, clerk, the clerks would call you Miss, you'd call them by their first names, even though, of course, they had far more power over you than, than, than you had over them. And that developed into um, what eventually became the idea, one of the ideas when we set up Matrix, was actually to run chambers in a much more business-like way, to bring in a chambers practice manager, um, to try and be less hierarchical, to, um, to treat the staff uh, more as co-workers uh, in, in, in this enterprise. Because again, in, you know, when I started, you, wouldn't, you weren't allowed to have friendships with solicitors, you weren't allowed to get to solicitors' offices. Uh, all that had changed and there was a lot more emphasis on marketing and working with solicitors. So we just wanted to break the old system and try and, and, and try a new way of, of, of working, if you like. Of course, the other reason we set up Matrix was because gradually, as the bar developed and chambers got bigger, people actually uh, specialised more. And we felt, I think, that, the, that it was a mistake to split off, particularly when you were dealing with human rights work, this idea that the criminal bar did one thing and the, the civil bar did another. We don't have an issue anymore to think about attracting women to the law because nowadays no one would say, oh, women can't be lawyers. When I was a student, the Glen Glanville Williams book, Learning the Law, that was given to us on the first day at the LSE, said in its chapter that, well, you know, women can be lawyers, but they're better off being solicitors because uh, women advocates are not successful because their voice doesn't travel as far in court as men. Now, you know, no one would say that any anymore in today's world we see a, you know i have been i've been in cases where virtually all the advocates were women i remember i was in a case in the court of appeal when there were three judges two women and one man and um when when the, my male opponent stood up to address them he kept saying my lord and my lady until eventually the 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 uh male judge leaned forward and said i think from now on perhaps you can just just dresses all as my lady. It was so funny. Um, the problem, a greater problem, isn't so much men and women these days. It's actually about um, economic diversity, if I can put it that way. It's about whether a girl like me, with absolutely no money, <laughs> 
could actually even make it to get to get um, to, to, to law school, or if she could get it to law school, could she actually afford to then spend the, the vast amount of money that you have to spend now to, to qualify as a lawyer, and could you then support yourself uh, during pupillage? And so what we are seeing, I think, still is it's, it's much more difficult now for working class or people from disadvantaged backgrounds to come into the law in the first place because of the way we, we fund our system. Um, it's, it's very difficult, isn't it? And uh, that's something I feel very passionately about, something I uh, uh, try, try and work on. Uh, because we indeed do need to have diversity in the legal profession. It's, 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 uh, it's a problem, I think. We're actually going backwards. I think there are fewer state-educated people coming to the bar now than there were in the past.